Hi, I'd like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom here on WHUS Stores 91.7 FM. So thank you so much for tuning into my show this morning. We are going to be talking about World War II and specifically about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which were the two cities in Japan who were attacked by military forces of the U.S. and bombed with nuclear and atomic bombs. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is that it actually happened this week on August 6th and 9th, respectively, uh, 70 years ago. And so this is a week of remembrance for all of the people who died, the hundreds of thousands of citizens, uh, including women and children, who were incinerated and otherwise died from radiation poisoning from these bombs. War is the most destructive government program, and the role of the libertarian is to point out that war always destroys freedom, it destroys uh, wealth, it destroys innocent people's lives who have absolutely nothing to do with the war itself. And World War II is often referred to as the just and good war, and much of that has to do with Hitler and all the atrocities that he did, and also from the Japanese who bombed Pearl Harbor. But we are going to reinvestigate that war and try and figure out whether or not it was actually good and just that all of these 50 million people who died in that war died for that cause. And so the first article I would like to read is Why Americans Believe That Bombing Hiroshima Was Necessary by Gary G. Coles, medical doctor. August 6, 2015 is the 70th anniversary of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, a civilian city that had minimal military value despite the claims of President Truman when he announced the event to the American people. The whole truth of what the Nuremberg Tribunal would later help define as an international war crime and a crime against humanity has been heavily censored and mythologized ever since war-weary Americans in 1945 accepted the propaganda that the bombings were necessary to shorten the war and prevent the loss of a million U.S. soldiers during the allegedly planned November 1945 invasion. Of course, the reason that the United States wasn't sanctioned like Germany was for the Jewish Holocaust was that America was the victor and the occupier, and thus it was in charge of making and enforcing the rules in the New World Order. The United States military ambushed the equally defenseless Nagasaki city three days later and with the second atomic bomb to be ever used against a civilian population that no longer had any military value to Japan. The Fat Man, the plutonium bomb named after Winston Churchill, was detonated before the Japanese leadership fully understood what had happened at Hiroshima. My high school history teachers all seemed to be ex-jocks who weren't athletically talented enough to make it to the majors. The main chance for them to continue playing games for pay was to join the teaching profession and coach high school athletics. American history was of secondary importance in many small-town high schools, but it hardly made the list of interests for coaches who reluctantly accepted the job. And so my classmates and I, quote, learned our lessons from some very uninspired, very bored, and or very uninformed teachers who would rather have been playing on the playing field. In my coach's defense, the history books that they had to teach from had been highly censored in order to promote patriotism, and so we learned that most everything that the noble British colonizers and honorable U.S. empire builders ever did in the history of warfare was self-sacrificing, democracy-promoting, and Christianizing, and that everything their freedom-seeking, revolutionary, colonial victims did was barbaric, atheistic, and evil. Anybody who resisted colonial oppressors was treated as a terrorist. It was from these history books that we learned about the glorious end of the war against Japan via nuclear incineration. Everybody in my high school, including myself, swallowed the post-war propaganda hook, line, and sinker. Of course, I now realize that my classmates and I, just like most other Americans, including the volunteer or conscripted members of the military, have been naive victims of, quote, lies our history teachers taught us. 
In their defense, those teachers had been misled in their own schooling by equally misinformed teachers who got their information from a variety of disinformers who wrote the books. And those authors were the war and empire justifying militarists and assorted uber patriotic suedo historians who had been duped into believing the myth of American exceptionalism. Not included in that group of true believers were the 50,000 World War II American soldier members of the greatest generation, who in many cases logically and understandably deserted or went AWOL during their war service, a reality that has been conveniently censored out of our consciousness. One of General Douglas MacArthur's first acts after taking over as Viceroy of Japan was to confiscate or otherwise destroy all the photographic evidence documenting the horrors of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He imposed total censorship over journalists who wanted to report to the world about what had really happened at Ground Zero, again proving the old adage that the first casualty of war is truth embedding journalists in the U.S. military so that only America-friendly reportage happened wasn't the original idea of General Stormin Norman Schwarzkopf in World Gulf War I. Back in 1995, the Smithsonian Institution was preparing to correct some of the 50-year-old suedo patriotic myths about the Pacific War by staging an honest, historically accurate display dealing with the atomic bombings from the Japanese civilian perspective. Swift, vehement, and well-orchestrated condemnations directed at the Smithsonian historian's plans to tell unwelcome truths about war came from right-wing, pro-war veterans' organizations, the GOP-dominated Congress at the time, and other militarist groups, such as Newt Gingrich's paymaster Lockheed Martin, one of many war-profiteering merchants-of-death multinationals whose profits and products depend on congressional and Pentagon largesse. Gingrich actually threatened to stop federal funding of the Smithsonian, thus forcing it to censor out all of the contextually important parts of the real story. And so the suedo-patriotic myths about Hiroshima and Nagasaki continue to be preserved to this very day. We, historically illiterate Americans, are blocked again and again from learning historical truths about the American empire and the control that the military and multinational corporations have over it. Anything that might shake voter confidence in or incite grassroots revolution against the unelected ruling elites, the Pentagon, or the conscienceless transnational corporations is verboten. The Smithsonian historians did have a gun to their heads, of course, but in the melee, we voters failed to learn an important historical point, and that is this. The war in the Pacific could have ended in the spring of 1945 without the need for the August atomic bombings, and therefore there might have been no Okinawa bloodbath that senselessly doomed thousands of American Marines, soldiers, and sailors and there would have been no need for an American land invasion of Japan in November. Indeed, in the 1980s, released top-secret records revealed that the contingency plans for a large-scale U.S. invasion would have been unnecessary. To the victors go the spoils, and the American victors were the ones running the war crimes tribunals and thus also determined the content of my history textbooks. American intelligence agencies, with the full knowledge of President Roosevelt's and President Truman's administrations, were fully aware of Japan's search for ways to honorably surrender months before Truman gave the fateful order to incinerate Hiroshima. Japan was working on peace ne negotiations through its ambassador in Moscow as early as April of 1945, with surrender feelers from Japan occurring as far back as 1944. Truman knew of these developments because the U.S. had broken the Japanese code even before Pearl Harbor, and all of Japan's military and diplomatic messages were being intercepted. On July 13, 1945, Foreign Minister Togo wrote, quote, Unconditional surrender, giving up all sovereignty, including the deposing of Emperor, Emperor Hirohito, is the only obstacle to peace. Truman's advisors knew about these efforts, and the war could have ended through diplomacy by simply conceding a post-war figurehead position for the emperor, who was regarded as a deity in Japan. 
That reasonable concession was, seemingly illogically, refused by the U.S. in their demands for unconditional surrender, which was first demanded at the 1943 Casablanca Conference between Roosevelt and Churchill, and then reiterated at the Potsdam Conference between Truman, Churchill, and Stalin. Still, the Japanese continued searching for an honorable peace through negotiations. Even Secretary of War Henry Stimson said, quote, The true question was not whether surrender could have been achieved without the use of the bomb, but whether a different diplomatic and military course could have led to an earlier surrender. A large segment of the Japanese cabinet was ready in the spring of 1945 to accept substantially the same terms as those finally agreed on. In other words, Stimson knew that the U.S. could have ended the war before Hiroshima. After Japan officially surrendered on August 15, 1945, MacArthur allowed the emperor to remain in place as spiritual head of Japan, the very condition that forced the Japanese leadership to refuse to accept the earlier humiliating unconditional surrender terms. So, the two essential questions that need answering in order to comprehend what was going on behind the scenes are these. 1. Why did the U.S. refuse to accept Japan's only demand concerning its surrender? And 2. Why were the atomic bombs used when victory in the Pacific was assured? There are a number of factors that contributed to the Truman administration's fateful decision to use the atomic bombs. 1. Investment the U.S. had made a huge investment in time, mind, and money, a massive $2 billion in 1940 dollars, to produce three bombs, and there was no inclination and no guts to stop the momentum. 2. Revenge The U.S. military and political leadership, as did many ordinary Americans, had a tremendous appetite for revenge because of the Pearl Harbor surprise attack. Mercy wasn't in the mindset of the U.S. military, the war-weary populace, or even of average American Christians and their churches. The missions against Hiroshima and Nagasaki were accepted as necessary, with no questions asked by most of these folks, who only knew the sanitized national security state version of events. Most Americans wanted to believe the cunningly orchestrated propaganda. 3. A use-it-or-lose-it mentality and scientific curiosity. The fissionable material in Hiroshima's bomb was uranium. The Trinity test bomb exploded on July 16, 1945, and the Nagasaki bomb were pl plutonium bombs. Scientific curiosity was a significant factor that pushed the project to its deadly completion. The Manhattan Project leaders were curious. What would happen if a city was leveled by a single uranium bomb? What would happen if plutonium was used? Now that the war against Nazi Germany, the original intended target, was over, the most conscientious scientists felt that the bombs should not be used against civilian targets. 4. Orders are orders. Actually, the military decision to drop both bombs had been made well in advance of August 1945. Accepting the surrender of Japan prior to their use was not an option if the experiment was to go ahead. It should be obvious to anybody that the three-day interval between the two bombs was unconscionably short if the purpose of the first bomb was to force immediate surrender. Japan's communications and transportation capabilities were in shambles, and no one, neither the U.S. military nor the Japanese high command, fully understood what had happened at Hiroshima. It is a fascinating fact that the Manhattan Project had been so top secret that even MacArthur, commanding general of the entire Pacific Theater, had been kept out of the loop until July 1st. 5. The Russians Stalin had proclaimed his intent to enter the war with Japan 90 days after VE Day, Victory in Europe Day, May 8th, 1945, which would have been two days after Hiroshima was bombed. Indeed, Russia did declare war on Japan on August 8th and was advancing eastward across Manchuria when Nagasaki City, the center of Japan, Japanese Christianity, was incinerated. Certainly Russia was still feeling the sting of humiliating defeat and the loss of territory from the disastrous Russo-Japanese War of 1905 when they were beaten by upstart Japan. Both elephants and ego-bloated nation-states have long memories, especially when they lose an argument, lose a fight, or are embarrassed in public. 
Witness the 150-year-old enduring promise from segregationist devotees of the Confederate flag like Dylan Roof, the KKK, and the White Citizens Council that the South will rise again. Or consider the rabid right-wing sociopathic neo-Nazis all around the world in their devotion to Adolf Hitler and their symbol of fascism, the swastika. The U.S. didn't want Japan surrendering to Russia and thus sharing the spoils of war. Russia was soon to be one of only two world superpowers and therefore a future enemy of the United States. So the first messages of the Cold War were sent by the U.S. to the USSR on August 6th and 9th of 1945. Quote, Stalin, stay away from Japan's carcass. We own it. And besides, we have the bomb. Russia didn't receive the spoils of the Pacific War that they had anticipated, and the two superpowers were instantly mired in the multi-trillion dollar stalemated nuclear arms race and the multitude of proxy wars that regularly risks the total extinction of humanity. What also happened along the way was the moral bankruptcy of both of the paranoid superpower nations that insisted on fighting the stupid Cold War, a war that was fueled by war profiteering corporations and borrow and spend economics. An estimated 80,000 innocent civilians plus 20,000 weaponless young Japanese conscripts died instantly in the Hiroshima bombing raid. Hundreds of thousands more suffered slow deaths and disabilities from agonizing burns, radiation sickness, leukemia, anemia, thrombostipenia, and untreatable infections. The Japanese survivors and their progeny suffered a fate similar to the survivors and progeny of America's, quote, atomic soldiers. Atomic soldiers were those soldiers who were exposed in the line of duty to the hundreds of nuclear tests in the 50s and 60s, or to the depleted uranium that the U.S. military used in the two Gulf Wars. Each of those groups were afflicted with horrible radiation-induced illnesses, congenital an anomalies, genetic mutations, immune deficiencies, cancers, and premature deaths, still going on to this very minute. Another shameful reality that has been covered up is the fact that 12 American Navy pilots, their existence well known to the U.S. command prior to the bombing, were instantly incinerated in the Hiroshima jail on that fateful day. So the official War Department approved highly censored version of the end of the war in the Pacific was added to an ever lengthening list of myths that we Americans have been continuously fed by our corporate controlled military, political, and media opinion leaders. In the process, the gruesomeness and cruelty of war that has been cunningly propagandized so that we consumers of information see only the glorification of American militarism. Among the other censored-out realities include what really happened in the U.S. military's participation in the destabilize and conquer campaigns in coup d'etat in Ukraine, Honduras, Venezuela, Libya, and bloody invasions and or occupations of Korea, Iran, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Lebanon, Grenada, Panama, the Philippines, Chile, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Haiti, Colombia, Kuwait, Iraq, Afghanistan, etc., etc. This list doesn't necessarily cover the unaccountable secret Pentagon CIA covert operations and assassination plots in the rest of the world where some 150 sovereign nations have been coerced into allowing the building of American military bases, permission lavishly paid for by bribes or threats of economic or military sanctions. But somehow, most of us still hang on to our shaky, my country, right or wrong, patriotism, desperately wanting to believe the cunningly orchestrated myths that say that the war profiteering corporate elite and the politicians, military leaders, and media talking heads who are in their employ only work for peace, justice, equality, liberty, and, quote, making the world safe, not for democracy, but for predatory capitalism. While it is true that the U.S. military has faced down the occasional despot with necessary sacrifice from dead and incurably wounded in body, mind, and spirit, American soldiers and veterans, more often than not, the rationalizations for going to war are the same as those of the godless communists, the anti-American insurgents and freedom fighters who just want us Yankees to go home where we belong. 
August 6th and 9th, 1945 are just two more examples of the brainwashing that goes on in all total war political agendas, which are consistently accompanied by the inevitable human death and destruction that is euphemistically labeled splendid slaughter, collateral damage, or friendly fire. It might already be too late to rescue and resuscitate the moribund, humanitarian, peacemaking America that we used to know and love. It might be too late to effectively confront the corporate hijacking of liberal democracy in America. It might be too late to successfully bring down the arrogant and greedy ruling elites who are selfishly dragging our planet down the road to destruction. The rolling coup d'etat orchestrated by the profiteers of what I call friendly American fascism may have already accomplished its goals. But I suppose there is always hope rather than being silent and destabilizing conflicts that the warmongers are provoking all over the planet with the very willing assistance of Wall Street, the Pentagon, the weapons industries, and their lapdogs in Congress. People of conscience need to start learning the whole truth of history despite the psychological discomfort they may feel, cognitive dissonance, when the lies that they have been led to believe can't be believed anymore. And so the whistleblowers among us can rise up in dissent and courageously refuse to cooperate with those sociopathic personalities that have gradually transformed America into a criminal, rogue state. Like Nazi Germany or fascist Japan, rogue nations throughout history have been eventually targeted for downfall by its billions of angry, fed-up, suffering victims who live both inside and outside its borders. That fate awaits America unless its leaders confess their sins, honestly ask for forgiveness, and truly promise to join the peace-loving human race. Doing what is right for the whole of humanity for a change, rather than just doing what is profitable or advantageous for our overprivileged, overconsumptive, toxic, and unsustainable American way of life, would be real honor, real patriotism, and an essential start towards real peace. That article was by Gary G. Coles. He is a retired family physician from Minnesota who practiced holistic mental health care for the last decade of his career. He often dealt with the horrific psychological consequences of veterans and civilians who had suffered psychological, neurological, and or spiritual trauma. He continues to be involved with peace, nonviolence, and justice issues, and often writes about mental ill health, toxic food issues, corporate pollution, the corporate controlled media, corporate controlled politics, crony capitalism, militarism, racism, fascism, imperialism, totalitarianism, economic oppression, anti environmentalism, and other violent, unsustainable anti democratic movements. So, in the short time that I have left with you, I'd like to focus on two kind of topics surrounding the Nagasaki and Hiroshima bombings, one being revenge and the other one being economic interests. So, in terms of revenge, many people cite the Pearl Harbor bombings as uh, the necessary revenge against Japan, which prompted the deadly bombings that killed hundreds of thousands of civilians. Now, there was uh, ample evidence that there was a lot of foreknowledge of these attacks and that Franklin Delano Roosevelt knew about these attacks and actually moved ships out of the way of the advancing Japanese army so as not to raise any alarm bells so that the military bases would be caught off guard. He even moved some of the more expensive and newer warships out of the line of fire and out of Pearl Harbor before the attacks actually occurred, which again implies some sort of foreknowledge of these events as they were unfolding. Um, moreover, there was uh, economic sanctions put on Japan before the Pearl Harbor bombings, which was meant to get Japan to into a desperate uh, situation where they would uh, stage this kind of attack because they were so desperate for the oil that they needed to continue on with their economic production. But even if there was no foreknowledge of the actual event, and even if Japan was not manipulated into actually causing Pearl Harbor to occur, was the 2,400 people who were killed at Pearl Harbor a justification for killing 200,000-some uh, innocent civilians in Japan? 
I'll leave you to answer that question for yourself. Now, as for the economic interests of war and the destruction of property, it's often said that World War II stimulated the American economy and got things rolling again, and if it were not for World War II, our economy still would have been stagnant from the uh, Great Depression that occurred right before it. And that is entirely a myth. Uh, war can never stimulate consumption and can never stimulate the economy. This is a Keynesian myth where government spending somehow benefits the economy because we're spending resources. Look, there's guns, there's bombs, uh, people getting blown up, there's, there's stuff happening. It must be good for the economy. But this is not valid in terms of Austrian economics, which provides the insights that real wealth comes from voluntary market interactions and voluntary trade and not from taxation and force and war and violence. So you can picture people building bombs and spending hundreds of hours building these bombs, and then they drop them on cities, which also destroys not only the bomb itself, which took hundreds of hours and resources and all this stuff to build, uh, not only destroys the bomb, but also destroys all the civilian architecture and the houses and all of the stuff that was built over time and all the resources that went into that. You know, if people are, are environmentally friendly and really want to conserve the resources on Earth, they have to be anti-war because uh, war is, is such a dramatic destruction of resources, uh, of the scarce resources that we have on this planet. Picture, if you will, two battleships who are built with all their electronics and massive amounts of resources, the steel, all the metal that goes into building them. Picture them going out into the ocean, two battleships, and then you sink them right to the ocean floor. And all those resources that you invested in them are gone forever, just totally destroyed. And ultimately, that is what war is. It is the destruction of person and property, ultimately for the economic gain of the states that employ those resources and those people in that war. So thank you so much for tuning into my show this morning. This has been a presentation of the Austrian Circle. We have been talking about the Hiroshima bombings of August 6th and 9th of 1945, which happened 70 years ago. So thanks so much for tuning into my show. I hope that you have a great week. Take care.